What's happening? Welcome to another episode of Beats for Breakfast. Today I am joined by another very special guest. We are joined by Gamer Thumbs. What's going on, man? How you doing? What's up, man? I'm doing wonderful today. Excited. Man, I'm excited to have you to have you on because it's like I've I I've found been trying out, to set it up for a while. We have, we have. Shit. And it's been a it's been it's been a few things. I heard about your channel last year through Mikel and I was like, yo. Okay, and then not only Mikel, Mikel and your player too. I was like, all right, this dude is cool. And then some of the videos that you have is it really just said, you know what? Subscribe. I gotta keep keep up with this. So definitely glad to have definitely glad to have you on, man. But how are you doing? How how's your week been going with all things considered? I'm good, man. Uh, it, it's been really busy because I've been streaming a lot ever since like quarantine happened. Mm -hmm. That's one thing about being a YouTuber. You're not necessarily affected from a, a what's the word I'm looking for, like a job point of view, because your job's online. But yeah. there's a lot of people stuck at home, so I've been trying to stream more to try to give people entertainment because everyone's at home right now, and it could be crazy, you know, being isolated all the time now. So let me so, ask. I want to ask you: does, does that create more opportunity? Yeah, I mean, obviously you'd want it under better circumstances. Yeah, you know, instead of a worldwide pandemic, but of, yeah, it, it obviously it, so. Yeah, it it does create more opportunity. Yeah, um, yeah. On top of everything else going on on the channel. Yeah, <laughs> and you, you, like you're right, you don't want it under these circumstances, especially when there's like death tolls involved and things of that nature. But it's. It's like the best reason why I ask because it's like I try to find positives in these negative situations because it's like there's so many people who I'm, you know, I'm blessed to still have my job working from home, but there are a lot of people who are out of work right now. And mm -hmm. it's it's crazy. So it's I definitely do want to talk about, you know, YouTube because doing YouTube full time is a grind, whether there's a pandemic or not, the you know, the ball don't stop doing it part time is a chore too so like that's also a grind <laughs> yeah, we, we get into that i, the, I, I talk all day we, about we, 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 we could talk all day about that um i wow you know i'm gonna give the floor to you go ahead like part time or full time because <laughs> i have a lot to say about that myself but i'm gonna hand the floor to you on that well i, I started doing youtube what was it april I, I think i created my channel february 2016 so this is year number four so and for me, I'll get into the whole detailed backstory later, but for me, I went into YouTube with the goal of doing it full time eventually because I, man, I went from like, I went to college, did the four year degree thing, got high paying job, hated everything about it, made a lot of money, hated everything about my job. So I, I just got sick of jumping from job I hate to job I hate, call center to call center. It just, I wanted to do something that I enjoy. And I, I just kind of gravitated towards YouTube. So 2016, I went full time two years ago, 20. What year is it? 2020? Yeah. I think about it sometimes. <laughs> but, man, when, let me tell you, when you do YouTube full time, time just blends together. So you lose track of time. So we're in 2020. That means full time summer 2018 is when I went full time. And think about going full time. The, the craziest thing about it is you think to yourself, man, when I have this job out of the way and I'm full time, I'll have all the time in the world to do all these videos I want to do. It, that's not how it works. Something else is going to fill your time, especially you have a family, right? Yes, you have sir. kids and everything. So you know how it is. I got a fiance that I live with. We got two kids, two dogs. So when you're full time, suddenly you're home all the time. So you have this other side uh, of the equation where now you have to kind of, uh, train people to let them know that when you're working on YouTube, it's not fun and games, it's work, but being at home could be very distracting, so there's, god, I could talk for like an hour about being full-time, it's crazy. Bro, uh, it's crazy. The, the, it's funny, we're almost like cousins in a way, because I started my channel March 2016. Oh, really? So this is year four for me as well, and I didn't go into with the goal of full time. I just said it, it, this is a hobby. I didn't have the idea of trying to go full time until January. No, no, no. Scratch that. December 2017. Mm. And what caused that was a string of deaths in the family. Like four, wow. 
like f like literally four back to back and it literally made me it literally made me look at life differently and it says you really only got one shot at this life and it could go at any moment because some like not to give out and everything but there was people who like we lost in their 40s and that's heartbreaking because it's almost like that's young yeah you're young it's like you're still a, it, it too it, it's like i'm i just turned 32 on sunday last sunday so it's like to a lot of people i'm still considered a kid to a lot of people to a lot of o older folks i'm still considered right, right. a kid and they consider them kids as well in a sense and you could kind of call them middle age but to someone who's like 60 70 years old that's still really young to lose people yeah it's true and the thing about it is when i saw um you know, YouTube is an opportunity to do it full time. You're right. It's around the time I went January. Uh, my daughter, she was born um, a month after that. So I was home a little bit for, you know, because, you know, I know my wife and everything and during that time. And even just being home during that period, doing YouTube full time, you would think like, all right, you know, you don't have to go to your job. You can still do this. You can do that, do that. You have so many things that still fill up your schedule and during the day, yep. like you said, and yep. it's 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 the reason why I prefer night times to work because it's a time when I said the house is quiet, even though we live in an apartment. It's like I could still, you know, project my voice and not disturb anyone too much. I could still do, you know, YouTube the way I can part time. The kids are in bed, right? always yeah. and yeah. i i get i get where you're going i get what you mean by this it's, it is a grind to do it you know part-time or full-time so it's like my salute to you with that and i wanted to really ask you what were some of the mental hurdles you had to overcome to sustain this because you you're going on two Man. years yeah mental hurt let me tell you about the mental hurdles they they never go away it, it's something that it's like any job you're always gonna have obstacles so you just yeah. constantly have to overcome I think the biggest the the biggest mental hurdle is keeping up with the grind because when you use the word grind, I mean it, it's literally what YouTube is. You, you're there's never there's never time off, basically. Nah. So if I'm not creating videos, I'm playing something for recording purposes, creating thumbnails, um, self promoting is the most important thing when it comes to this. So posting on social media, keeping up with messages and community. 50,000 other things so one of the mental hurdles is staying motivated you know and for me what works I, I guess it's a good time for me to get into how I started with YouTube because Go right ahead. for me what works is remembering remembering um how bad things were because when I started I was at American Express working from home for like four years really high paying job I mean it, it was one of those things where I was just doing it for the paycheck yeah, what did you used to work there? No, I I know people. Oh, okay. <laughs> I so will say about if, it, you yeah. know someone that works for. I mean, they throw money at you. Yeah. Like I, I was really good at sales, so like for like two or three months in a row, I got my paychecks plus like a a four thousand dollar bonus check for surpassing goals. It's really good money, but at, at the time, me and my fiance had just moved out together to an apartment, and it was it was such a rough transition because I moved out from home. Moved to a new apartment. The entire time I had this job, I hated that I worked from home, too. So it sounds nice when you work from home, right? On paper. It doesn't because you... I, I'm a, I, I know what you're going with this. It's like the ills and the stress of the job is now in what is supposed to be your castle Ooh. now. Your, your stronghold. It's the place you go to rest your head. That's a place of stress now. That becomes your work. But at the same time, yeah. like... I was, my desk was in a corner of a room. I'm staring at a wall with a window on my left side, eight to 10 hours a day, five days a week. I mean, that takes its toll on you, no matter how much money they're throwing at you. So I, mm. I got to the point where I, I just got sick of it. Like, you know, you know, when you, you hate a job so much, eventually what happens? You start calling out, you start finding reasons not to go there. You start getting written up. They start looking for reasons to get rid of you. I was at that point in life and I was just, I was tired of it. I was already playing with the idea of being a YouTuber. So I, you know, I talked to my fiance, did my research. And I was like, you know, I think I want to do YouTube, but it's probably take a couple years full time. So I actually, what I did 
I decided to quit my job and I went one whole year. I said, I'm going to give it one year, grow the channel as much as possible. And then after that, find small jobs until I could go full time forever. So that's what I did. So here's what happened. After I quit my job, I ended up, I had money saved up, obviously, for the year where I wouldn't be working because YouTube being full time for the first year, I mean, I was making like a fifth of a penny monthly. It was nothing. So mm. it was just to grow the channel. Two months later, after I quit my job, my fiance got fired from the same job because she was pregnant. So she was pregnant with our daughter at the time. Um, here's the thing. It's illegal to fire a woman for being pregnant. But it happens. All they do is blame other reasons. So they, they, they said that she used to get up to go to the bathroom too much. She was pregnant. <laughs> she was pregnant. Realistically, we probably could have sued and gotten a fat paycheck from them. But we, we just didn't want to get involved in all that. So, yeah, that's when I started my channel. I had just quit my job. She was going to foot the bill for a $2,000 a month apartment we were living in. And then two months later, she got fired. And I was doing YouTube earning like nothing. So the first year, that's what it was. So, yeah, talking about mental hurdles, that entire first year was just stress, stress, stress. But at the end of the day, I mean, it, it pays off because I'm doing something I enjoy. It, it It is years of stress if you want to go full time. Really, I just had a buddy, actually, that he started a channel like a year ago. And I, he thought he could just start a channel, go full time in like a year and call it a day. He just quit YouTube because in a year he only grew 500 subs, which is really good, actually. That's really good. <laughs> For your first year. But I was like, I mean, did you expect it to be faster than that? Like there's it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. So it does yeah. take a lot of work. I mean, I went from 100 to 1000 in about nine months in that 2018 when I wanted to go full time. But I, I can relate to your story. It's like it's it's stress because I got to the point where I had to ask myself, do I really enjoy this content that I'm making? And it's, you said something key. You're doing something that you enjoy. And for anyone that's watching, it's like if you're going to do YouTube full time, make sure you enjoy the content you're putting out. Because for me, the reason why I haven't really uploaded anything edited wise on the main Avedon Smith channel is because I've been thinking, what can I do consistently that I will enjoy, that I would love seeing, that isn't a carbon copy of other people in my circle? Because that's right. another thing. It's like the one thing about YouTube no one wants to tell people is you are competing for time. You're competing for everyone else's time. So it's best not to look like a carbon copy like your peers, because if your peer has been doing this longer than you, they may go with what they're used to. And that's natural. That's just human life. Yeah. But um, it's good that you went through it. It's good that, you know, you stuck to it because now it's like you could be a leading example, a realistic example of what it's like doing YouTube full time. It's I feel as though it's hard. You know, another one is, you know, Mikel Casanova, who's been on the show before. He's another one doing it full time. I feel like Ooh. you guys are dimes and like are rare because it's like people who are doing this full time. You don't see too many people under 100K doing it full time. You you normally don't. The fact that you are is amazing. And it's I wanted to actually go into a little bit of a deeper question. And I wanted to ask, you know, during a pandemic like this, um, is there ever an issue with YouTube AdSense? You know, it's funny you ask that because I see um, I've been seeing a lot of creators complaining about it lately that. YouTube's paying nothing right now and, and all this and that. I, I haven't experienced any real issue with that. I mean, and keep in mind, I make most creators will tell you that you can't make it full time on YouTube from AdSense. That's what I do. That's what I've been doing for since I went full time, since I started the channel. So it's, I mean, you might hear differently from other YouTubers, but that's been my experience. I mean, my full-time income is from AdSense. I, I mean, I have a Patreon, but that, realistically, that brings in maybe 50, 60 bucks a month, you know? It's good. It helps, and I save it for equipment, games to play on the channel, things like that. But, yeah, most of my income is, is from AdSense. And during the pandemic, I haven't really noticed there's been a, a major dip. Um, I'm not really sure why there would be, because more people are home watching, you know? And 
that's where I think streaming really helps on the channel because I mean YouTube really wants people to, to stay on the website long term so if you're streaming you get more eyes on the channel for longer periods of time so from a business sense of view I, I think that YouTube is kind of um, I, I guess the word is coronavirus proof to, in a way compared to traditional jobs where obviously like YouTube's not going to close and be like, oh, no more videos are allowed to upload because of the virus and social distancing. You know, it's still it's an online entity. In fact, it encourages to, on be on to be online even more because it's a, another social media platform. Exactly. So, yeah, dang, man. So that that's actually that's actually amazing because it's like, you know, hearing more people, you know, make their full time income off AdSense is it's amazing. Because it's like it teaches you one, it, 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 will, it will teach you money management to, to make sure that check lasts for the month. <laughs> but because I I've gotten um a few checks from YouTube AdSense, I said okay, this feels nice. Like you're getting paid to do something that you you like doing. So the fact that you could live yeah. off that is I'm, I'm sure it's an unimaginable well, feeling. And, and it directly reflects the work you put in, mm -hmm. you know, and um. That's a, it honestly bothers me when I hear larger creators try to discourage people from becoming YouTubers. Like, you all have these larger creators saying, it's impossible for anyone to make it on YouTube now. People were saying that when I started. And to be quite honest with you, I'm nobody special. I'm just a guy. I didn't have any connections. I didn't work for any gaming magazines. I'm just a guy that started a channel and kept up with it, and I'm doing it full time. And the reason I stress that is because I truly am no one special. If I can do this, Anyone could do it with enough hard work. I mean, anyone can. And, you know, you get these people complain that it's too hard. Of course it is. I mean, it, it, nothing nothing easy is worth doing. But you, you, know? you said it You said it right there, man. It's like a lot of people don't necessarily want to put in the hard work. That's the, that's, that's the issue. A lot of people don't want to put in the work required. It's almost like people want the rewards without the actual training for it. It's like everybody wants to be, you know, a LeBron James or Michael Jordan or Tom Brady. You know, everyone wants to be that superstar that everyone reveres and sees and you get the high paying paycheck of it. But you don't want to train like Michael Jordan. You don't want to train like LeBron James. You don't want to train like Tom Brady. You don't even want to train like Stephen Curry. You don't want to train like any of these athletes. So to put it in YouTube, you don't want to put in the hard work as Gamer Thumbs does. You want to put in the hard work as anyone else that you've seen doing YouTube full time does. If you're not willing to put in as much work or even more than what these people are doing, you don't deserve to get paid for it. Well, and, and I'm glad you mentioned the hard work because here, here's the thing about YouTube: like the first like year, you're gonna suck. Like for example, yeah. for people first starting out, like I go back and watch my very first I video. No, I go back and watch my first video. I'm like, oh, God, that joke was awful. <laughs> the gain on my mic is way too damn high. I've got my webcam, like, angled up, so I'm like this, which that's a big no-no. You're not supposed to, like, face your, your webcam up at your head. It's just, it's real bad, but you learn. You you keep at it. You keep learning. You know, when I started YouTube, I barely knew how to edit, mo any, uh, edit videos. Like, I still use Windows Movie Maker. A lot of people are shocked by exactly. I get that look all the time, and I get I get my friends all the time like, "Bro, you got to get on Adobe Premiere," and I'm just like, "I have Premiere," but I like Movie Maker. Like that's what I started with. I'm comfortable with it, and when I pump out these these like long videos, whenever people ask me what software I use, and I say Movie Maker, their jaw drops. So like, you did not do that on Movie Maker. I was like, I swear I did. But I, be I believe it. That's I'm what I started with. Like I I started my channel. I had no idea how to edit. You know how I learned? Not by going to college and learning it, because let me tell you something. I went to college for a couple years for digital media also before I got my degree, which is supposed to teach you these kind of things. I didn't learn anything. I didn't learn anything, and I got A's and B's in my classes. All we did was create some basic things online and they'd give you a grade and give you a degree and call it a day. I still didn't know how to edit a video. So you know what I did? I looked for YouTube tutorials. I learned from YouTube how to do YouTube. You know, you do your research, you learn, you try your hand at things. You just, you just got to keep at it, and that it goes right back to the grind. The more you do something, the more you become a master of it. 
You know, if I compare my videos now to when I first started, like it's embarrassing. My first videos are garbage, but everyone's are. You just you got to keep going with it. It's funny, but yeah, man. Said. Movie maker. I started with movie maker <laughs> myself, actually. Um, I started with movie maker myself, and then I went over to Filmora, and I like Filmora because Filmora is sixty dollars for a lifetime membership. I was like, okay, I can go with that, and going with movie maker to now i would say i didn't like you i didn't have any experience dealing with it but the only experience i did have was audio editing because i made music for years which was self-taught so i was like okay it can't be too much different from this and we just learn of okay link this together oh that transition just trial and error and you youtube a few different things like how do i get a green screen effect and you go youtube stuff like that then yeah it really works out so man i yo talking to you is, is inspiring because it's like i wanted i wanted to really uh chop it up with you about um content creation because it's something that has always interested me and i wanted to I wanted to see just your ways also with content creation is what are your thoughts on diversifying your income outside of AdSense? If you like, if you thought of other ways and everything, like what are some other ways like content creators can diversify their income outside of AdSense, you know, you know, with Patreon, things like that. Yeah, it's, it's not a bad idea. It's not going to hurt you. It's actually a really good idea. Mm -hmm. Um, It's something, I mean, as a content creator, I know I have some flaws too. That's one of them. I should be diversifying my income more. Because let's say tomorrow YouTube comes and they're like, you're demonetized forever for some reason. Like, I'm screwed. You know? Yeah. So, yeah, diversifying your income is a great idea. I mean, there's, there's Patreon. Uh, you can open up a Teespring store. which, But I really don't advertise those things very much. I just let my community know I have them. And then mm-hmm. I just let them watch my channel. Because people that, people that want you to succeed and build that loyalty with your channel Mm -hmm. they're gonna want you to have those things like for example patreon the only reason i started one was because people kept asking me for one as a content creator your audience owes you nothing they don't owe you anything Mm -hmm. you know you make the content if they like you as a person if they like your content they'll be there no matter what you do no matter what you produce and then to have them come on your channel and then you berate them for not giving them you five dollars a month like get off your high horse i can't i shake my head and i'm like why why are people thinking that this is okay like why do people think that you can just tell somebody or you could kind of like you know up somebody up to say hey you know if you could you know you could get this or you should do this you should do that and it's i can understand i can understand you know you 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 want to put it out there you want to advertise you know perks of you know subscribing and everything but there are tasteful ways of doing it to the way that's different than shaming people for not giving you money exactly i don't even know that girl's name i don't even remember what it was uh vader invader something i know what you're talking about yeah something like that i I, I don't follow twitch streamers i i follow some because some are really dope see okay i'm gonna say like ninety thousand subs (laughs) <laughs> she lost like 90,000 people and then she posted like some fake apology video but see that's the thing if if you're on if you have to beg your audience to donate to you then i mean at, at that point you're just treating each individual viewer like a number you know you're not treating them like people and i think that's what these larger creators miss out on it there's this disconnect between these huge creators and their audience where every subscriber is just another number to fill their pockets and you can't like one of my my favorite thing to do on my channel is stream for one reason because the fact that viewers come and hang out with you you create that interaction you know you have these these channels that complain that streaming kills your channel i haven't experienced that but what they're really missing out on is that connection you build with your audience that's priceless because those people are going to constantly keep coming back looking forward to your content like wow this creator actually interacts with me and sees me as a person instead of just another number to in- inflate this subscriber count you know i i have to stop myself because i'm trying my best i want to hear everything you want to say because when you say different a lot, a lot of things you're saying is like i resonate with a lot 
I am against the term small content creator in the, in the context of how it's used. Because a lot of times people will say, you know, under 10,000, under 1,000 people, you're a smaller content creator. You're, and I'm like, hold on, wait, wait a second. I'm against that term completely. I, I said, thank you. And I, and I said, when you, if you was to fit even 300 people, 300 people is, a, is corporate, is, is, that's businesses. How is, how are you going to say that's a small amount of people? I said, if you was to fit 300 people in this room, first of all, 300 people wouldn't fit in this, in this place. To Second of all, you wouldn't be able to even see me. So it's like, how can you consider that a small number? You know what I'm, you know what I'm saying? It's, that's why it baffles me. That's, um, I was just editing an episode for Beast of Breakfast today. Um, and I said, you know, we're not going to call her a lower, uh, a smaller content creator because 500, 500 people is not, is not small. That's not right. small to me. That well, you is. limit yourself. You're putting yourself in a box. Thank you. When you call yourself that, like, it's funny because I, I was just talking to Mikel the other day on Facebook about this, and I, I forgot how we got into it, but he's like, dude, you almost have 60,000 subs. You're huge. And I was like, in my mind, I'm still a small, you know, I'm, I'm not a huge creator at all because think about this. I might have almost 60,000 subs, but PewDiePie's got like, what, how many million? 100 million, I think. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, in that, I'm a grain of sand on a, on a huge beach. So it, it's all perspective. It's all perspective. You know, we're all content creators. We're all in here doing our thing. There's always going to be someone bigger than you, unless you're PewDiePie that's literally yeah. number one. I actually want to ask you one last thing, though. If there was anything that you could do differently from when you first started to now, what would it be? Oh, man, a ton of stuff. I mean, with all the knowledge I have now, I, I would have started live streaming earlier. Um, I would have started spreading myself on social media earlier. That's very important. Mm -hmm. When I first started, I, I had like my, my personal Facebook. I had my Gamer Thumb Facebook, and, and that's about it. And I didn't open a Twitter until like two years after I started. You know, and I think that's that's really what helps you grow is social media. Because I, I would have never met you were it not for social media. You know, nice. you have to network with other creators and other people. And when I first started, I wasn't really in that mindset. My mindset was just, I need to get more videos out. So at the time, I was doing like two to three videos a week. And that's another thing, too. Burnout's a real thing on YouTube. Like, you need to... I don't operate by a schedule now, except streaming. That's a schedule. But all my edited content, when people ask me, when's this out, when's that out, when it's out. I mean, I, I'm, I don't go by a schedule because I did that my first year. And I, I wish I didn't because then it just starts turning into work. <laughs> it starts turning into a regular job again. Because you just feel like you start doing things because you feel like you're on a deadline. So I, I think that's the major thing I would change. I would go back and do social media more. And I, I would not worry so much about a schedule. Because I thought that was like the end-all be-all of YouTube is everything has to be on a tight schedule. It really doesn't. I've, I've come to realize that your audience cares more about your actual content than when you put it out. You know, and you might, some of that advice might be completely different from another YouTuber, but that's been my experience. I mean, my audience, I'll post something at like 3 a.m. on a Wednesday. It'll get the same amount of views if I post something on a Friday at 2 in the afternoon. So, yeah, not, not being so much on a schedule either. Definitely. Um, for me, as... For, at least for now, Beast for Breakfast is on a schedule. I said mainly because I just said it's I want to develop, you know, studying how this YouTube algorithm is. I just said, you know what, let me at least get some type, type of consistency because I know myself if I don't, I know for myself if I don't schedule myself, I may end up getting lazy. And the schedule is not so much for the viewers, but it's make sure. I stay in line. You get what I'm saying? Like I stay straight to make sure I say, you know, you know, you need yeah. to get, you need to get this done. So that's that's mostly it for me. But um, we're gonna go ahead and take a quick commercial break here, guys. Uh, in the meantime, I want you guys to check out this clip from Gamer Thumbs, uh, one of his later videos, and we'll be back shortly.
I thought the last video I made on Streets of Rage 4 was going to be the last one, since it seems that lately we've been getting this trickle of news coming out for this game, and the release date is right around the corner, so what else is there to announce? But here we go one more time! I'm so pumped about this game. With every new update, they add more stuff. We already have online play, I wish it was four players instead of two, but at least there's online play, it is four player local co-op. The retro characters are in there in their pixelated glory, alongside the more uh, modernized art style new characters. And I did say in my last video there was nothing left to complain about because of that, but I guess I was wrong. Now people want all the retro characters animated like the new ones, so it is what it is. They're there. Take it or leave it. There is one last game mode that was just revealed. If you're familiar with 90s beat-em-ups, there was always some kind of versus mode that was kind of slapped in there where you could just fight your friends. That's a real old school battle mode feature, and it's in Streets of Rage 4. The legacy battle mode is back. I kinda don't care about this mode too. Welcome back. Hope you enjoyed that commercial break. Um, we may only have one commercial break today because this is uh conversations like this, I don't like breaking up too much. So I want to go ahead and ask Fabian just one more question about just YouTube business. We're gonna get into some fun stuff. Well the this next question could be considered fun, but um, we're going to talk about the, the YouTube algorithm because this is something that is almost like the boogeyman for a lot of content creators and it kind of makes content creators overthink, you know, the, the yeah. packaging of their content. So I'm a little interested in your thoughts on the algorithm, man. Well, here's the thing about the algorithm. Um, here's the secret of the algorithm. The secret of the algorithm don't worry about it like in all honesty don't worry about it like i i'm full-time i am not this huge youtuber but i am full-time i've never once worried about the what the algorithm wants or doesn't want you know and he, here's the reality of the algorithm and i i have a youtube partner manager and i've i've talked to her regularly about this and she tells me straight up the algorithms really it's a self-learning ai in a way so it's constantly it's constantly changing so you have these kind of, um, I mean, there's people that make a career out of being like algorithm gurus that try to sell their services on explaining algorithms. It's all BS. It really is. Because the second you think you understand the algorithm, it changes. Because mm -hmm. it's ever changing with trends, what people are doing, what people are not doing, what people are watching, what people aren't watching. So what I've seen happen with people I personally know that all they do is focus on the algorithm. They start making content just to try to please this non-existent thing that they think they understand so it really takes the you out of your content you know i i that's why i say don't worry about the algorithm make content that you would enjoy that's how i've always gone about with youtube i make content that i would watch and with that people have come and watched it so yeah the algorithm exists but it's not really something that you should completely focus all your time on the, the the time you're wasting trying to figure it out and understand it you could be using creating content and figuring out what you want to do i agree like it's something that the algorithm it only makes me think about stuff with my titles and my descriptions and stuff like that and if anything i think that's just good best practices that make sure you have a, a good compelling title and you take the time to write what is a good description but other than that it's like you can't control you, you you can't control how the algorithm is the best you can yep. do is make the best content that you can make so one thing the algorithm does look at i know for a fact is um keywords in your title and description even like you know the regular tags you do mm -hmm. uh it doesn't even really look at those anymore like it more focuses on the description and title so yes. that that's the most important thing your title and description that you want to make sure it's very detailed and that's why like i i hate when people do these clickbait like uh they'll be like final fantasy honest review 
And it's like, you know, isn't a review supposed to be honest to begin with? Yeah, it's almost like... like that's like, not really a searchable keyword, honest, it's, with review. And I, I don't I don't like that. I don't like that feeling because it's almost like you're giving an implication that yours has more validity than other people's because you're yeah. thinking other people may... You think other people's excitement may not be valid. Other people's scores or or their rating scale may not be valid. And it's, you know, what parameters you may vote uh, or scale a game may not be the same as the next person. So it's like there's yeah. so many things to take take to mind with that. So Yeah, but um, I, I like talking about the algorithm, though, because I it, it's something I see in so many creators like people obsess over it. Yeah, and and you just see it all over social media too. Like anytime anything goes bad on YouTube, people just blame the algorithm. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe someone who just wasn't interested in that particular video you made for whatever reason, but the blame always goes to like you said, the boogeyman, the algorithm. Exactly. So it's just not something you should focus on as a creator. That that's my opinion, and I know there's going to be other creators that are on the complete opposite side of the fence of that. That's fine. I don't agree at all. That, that has not been my experience. So I'll say in, in all retrospect, like, what are some things, like you said, we already mentioned, like, you know, good titles, good descriptions. Like, what are some other ways or that a content creator can do to get more searchability in their on their end? One big thing is thumbnails. Thumbnails. My, my man. Thank you. It really <laughs> is. Because, like, I, I, I talked to Mikel about this the other day, too. One thing I hate are bad thumbnails. Like when I see a video and it's just a thumbnail of someone like making this face and just holding like a Switch game. It's like, okay, you look like 50,000 other creators out there. There's nothing original about that thumbnail. You know, like with, with my thumbnails, I always like, I, I wanted to make kind of a template. So all my thumbnails have the same style. You know, people do it differently, but just something that identifies your channel is you. So I'll usually have like a picture of the game or movie I'm talking about. I have my like little neon laser background. I usually have a stupid face on top of one of the characters of my face. But when people see it, they, they know it's you. my channel. Like they don't have to read the name of the channel or the description. It's recognizable. It's branding. That's branding. Brand, That's yeah. what you want to do from a brand market. Good brand identity. Great brand identity, yeah. actually. I 100% agree with that. Um, I actually for beats of breakfast and everything it's like you have you the and definitely one of my um friends suggested this idea for me but it's almost like the the versus type yeah deal. and i just said you know what as a fighting game enthusiast as someone who loves playing fighting games this works <laughs> yeah it, you gotta have a certain personality look and feel to your channel and like I come from a marketing background that that's what I graduated in like business management marketing. Mm -hmm. So that, that's how I think. Like when I first started channel, I was like, I need to build a certain look and feel to it. So that's something that comes with time, but it's very important to do that. Otherwise you're not going to stand apart from the C. I mean, have you searched like, just search like Nintendo switch on YouTube. You'll have a million results, a million channels, and you can see which thumbnails just like, which ones really stand apart from the rest you're just in a sea of thumbnails so you do have to have something that kind of sets you apart from all the others and the sad, the sad reality is it's funny as you're saying that i'm literally going on youtube right now just to so i'm doing the same thing <laughs> like i'm gonna type nintendo nintendo um what nintendo um switch what's the thing they do the um direct oh. let me type in nintendo direct because i know people are all into that Nintendo Direct, and I, the first things I'm seeing right now are Nintendo properties. Actually, you know what's probably better? Nintendo Direct Reaction. Let's see that. Yeah. Because now I'm getting actual, like, official Nintendo pages. That's not what I was intending. Like, type in Nintendo Direct Reaction. Yep. All right. So, without saying any names, what do you see? A bunch of thumbnails. Most of them say reaction in big letters. Someone making a face and like a big nintendo logo or them holding a nintendo game it's all the same do you see any thumbnails that really stick out no they really don't that's what i'm talking about so let's say you make a nintendo direct reaction if you don't make a good thumbnail you're just going to blend into this sea of white and red colors that you see scrolling up and down if anything what i would do differently in terms of just, of standing out I would have a green or a blue background. 
just so it yeah. sticks out more a green or a blue background and then if i was to put my face in something i would take a scene that nobody else is taking i would see all the scenes that everyone else is taking if everyone's reacting to almost the same scene i would take a different scene and and react to this one and then basically have myself in the thumbnail itself whether i'm reacting to it or whether i just you know show that you know some type of, of, of approval or something that you're in the video that's not yeah. the most uh that's not but you the see most, what i mean though yeah. about the thumbnails like you're scrolling down and like i'm still scrolling and there's nothing that's maybe like stop for a second be like oh that looks different it just all kinds of blends in yeah and i would say i would say you know after a while because for, for for one i would say for us being a a smaller channel it's it's a bit harder to get to be in a smaller channel it's a bit hard to get away with that because right, you're going to fall fall in the sea of different things where you are a larger channel one thing i will say the algorithm does help because you're getting that that click that quick click click through rate and you're getting a whole bunch of people come through to your channel quickly youtube is going to really help you out to be at the top of the page for people to look at because they YouTube's gonna think a lot of people like this video and you should go through it. So I, I kinda well just to add on to what you're saying, I partially disagree about the algorithm. When okay. you're in I use PewDiePie as an example because he's huge. Go ahead. At that point, at that point, the algorithm doesn't even matter. Because at yeah. that point you're so big you do whatever the hell you want and Yeah. You have a, a community of millions that are gonna watch. So that that's it's a combination of factors, man. That that's why it's not just the thumbnail it's not just the title it's not the description it's a it's a blend. combination of everything including yourself and your personality your content you can't just pick one aspect and just improve that you know you, you got to take everything into account yeah and it's like when you when you see that and it's it's like for me when i see when i saw, like saw those thumbnails i was like you know what i said these people they're doing their thing and I just told myself, what can I do differently? Because that, that's what I think I do. I do, when I used to do edited content uh, on my main channel, I would always look at the other thumbnails before making my own. Because I'm like, all right, if I'm gonna talk about something that everyone else is talking about, how can I stick out? To this, to this day, I think I still have um, videos that only I, that I still rank for, I still get a lot of views for. Uh, even with uh, Nintendo Switch drifting videos, like for this, I'm still getting views on this to this day. And I made this at the end of what, 2018, December 2018 or January 2019. I'm at 40K views with that. So it's like, you're right. Your thumbnails do matter. And um, you know what? I'm gonna throw an Easter egg. You should, uh, be f you should be okay to change your thumbnail change old thumbnails and see. i've done that yeah i when when i actually interesting fact here whenever i think like a year and a half in when i finally got like the style of my thumbnail and the style of my channel like a little more solidified i went back all the way through my first video and i updated all my thumbnails so That's it's definitely a good thing to um do and another ones. thing i want to touch on here I, I actually want to go back to that original question you asked me where you asked me what would I change yeah um, another thing too I want to touch on is the length of videos there, there's always this people are afraid to make videos that are either too short or too long and um, I used to operate like that like I used to make sure like if I'm doing a review of something there's be so much I want to say but I'd cut it off because I'd be like man uh, this has been going on almost 20 minutes no one's going to sit here and watch it so I, I've really come to learn that just my videos are going to be as long as they need to be. So just make whatever you want to make. I want to use an example of one of my videos. My top video is a Resident Evil Timeline Part... Hold on. Two? Part one, actually. All right, if I click into my video, it's got 1,209,000 views. That's my that's my most watched video. You know how long it is? Actually, hold on. There's an ad playing. I got to skip the ad on my own video so I can see the leg. I um, whoa. An hour and twelve minutes. I also have part two. 
that it's also has over a million. million views, about two hours long. So, and I have part four, 864,000 video views, almost three hours long. So, people don't watch long videos. You know, that, this, I use that as an example. This is a huge example, actually. I mean, yeah, it's about the content, not the length. So, I, I want to bring that up because I know a lot of people out there stress about things they shouldn't stress about when they're making videos. Like, worried about being too short, too long. It's about what's in there. If you have two to three hours of content that someone legitimately is interested in, they'll watch the whole thing. Definitely. I mean, I, I have videos that are like five to ten minutes long that get decent views. Some don't. You know, I just move on to other videos. But, yeah, you, you shouldn't you shouldn't use video length to really dictate what you make and what you don't make. That's something that, you know, it's like you're even freeing some change with me with that because it's almost like... There are times where I'm doing even some of these videos for Beats for Breakfast, and it's like, I guess, I guess part of me is time conscious because the per usually I don't discuss with the person. I tell them like about an hour, and it's like when I see them getting close to that, I'm like, okay, I don't wanna. I will always wanna make sure I'm honoring that person's time. So it's like it's hard for me. Yeah, that's why it's like certain people, like you know, Mikel and every day will tell me like, "Oh no, you're good for time. Like we could." No, yeah, and that's fine that you think like. I mean, just yeah. well, I'll throw it out there. Like for me, you're you're fine. Doesn't matter. Like <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll go on however long you want. But um, just limiting yourself because you're worried that you're basically if your audience stops watching your video halfway through, it's not because it's too long. It's because you didn't capture their attention. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah, and it's like it's. It's this this is a lot. It's definitely a lot. But um so before, you know, we went live, we kinda discussed that, you know, we're both huge Streets of Rage fans. And, you know, for me, I never actually got the experience uh Streets of Rage two or three or the Genesis. I'll be only my brother and I we only had Streets 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 of Rage one. So I need to ask you, like, how excited are you for Streets of Rage four, man? excited is not even the word like i'm i was gonna say pump but that that seems less um no like that that game it's it's gonna be a beautiful thing i hope it looks good which i've heard some complaints about the art style but i think it looks awesome i do too actually. I, I think it looks amazing um speaking of which well i i was gonna talk about battletoads but i guess i'll i'll, I'll talk about that a little ahead because that game's supposed to come out too and that got announced before streets of rage 4 and we still don't have battletoads and Streets of Rage 4 is coming out in a couple days here. But, um, yeah, I, I'm curious about the difficulty level. And I bring that up because the difficulty level is very different with Streets of Rage 1, 2, and 3. You know, 1 is, is pretty hard. 2 is really easy. 3 is brutal. So, three, like, three, 3... 3 will, will make you rage. The American version. The Japanese version is super easy. But the American version, they, they went nuts with the difficulty. So I'm curious at how Streets of Rage 4 is going to handle. Like, I wonder if they're going to do the more, um, let's just make a brutally hard route, or the more, let's cater to the game journalist route and make it real simple and easy. So that that's my biggest question. That That's what I'm really excited to do, to um, try it out myself and, and see how it's going to be. I'm getting it next week, day one, because, yeah. That's that's a game that I, I want. I want Streets of Rage 4. To, I played all of them, so I want Streets of Rage 4. And I just got a new SD card, so I said it's perfect. What do you think about the character roster? Because I've heard a lot of complaints. Listen, okay. They, you know, we still we still got we still got Axel, of course. We still, like we got the original. We got the original. Cat. You've we got, got the, the Trinity. We got the original three. Yeah, you can't lose me at that point. <laughs> exactly, you can't lose me at that point. I bring that up because I noticed something every time. I, I told you I've been covering that game on my channel. I saw it. every time there's been an update on a new character. I make a video on it, and like for example, the first character they showed off after, of course, Axel and, and Blaze is Cherry, uh, Adam's daughter. So my comment section was filled with people enraged that Adam isn't in the game, and I'm like chill out people like there's still a possibility and then they reveal adam. adam then everyone's mad because uh shiva isn't in the game so and then they release uh they want max 
because I don't know if you remember when they first showed the game, they had like the silhouettes mm-hmm. of the characters. One of them looks like a big guy. So people thought that was going to be Max. Turns out that's a new character, Floyd. So it was like, oh, this is going to suck. It's going to be Max. So I made a video on that. And then the next video I made was when they announced the retro characters. Everyone's in it. They're just pixelated, like, retro-style versions. They didn't have to do that. They you didn't know, have they... for nostalgia, and which is perfect. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm for that. Well, yeah, so, okay, everyone's there. What's there left to complain about? Now people are complaining that they don't have uh, the new art-style versions of those characters. And I'm like, my God, like... It sounded like people just wanted a Streets of Rage remaster and not a brand new title. Because you got to think, it's Streets of Rage 4. What has every Streets of Rage game done? Part 2 added Max and Skate as new characters. Part 3 added Dr. Zan. They keep adding characters and changing the roster. Mm -hmm. Why would 4 not do the same thing? Exactly. You're just going to have all the same people again? No, you're going to have some returning, some new ones. And then they gave you all these unlockable pixel art ones. And I feel so, like they may they may have some unlockable characters afterwards and everything. I want Rue the Kangaroo. That's the only one I'm waiting Bruh. for. You remember the Kangaroo? Bro, that's that's that was three, right? That was three. You fight him as a boss yes. yeah. and you can't kill him. If you can't if you don't kill him, you could play as him. Yo, see, Streets of Rage and like I said, that's Streets of Rage was a genre which I feel like a lot of people miss out on. It was a great beat 'em ups genre. Mm-hmm. And I feel a lot of people are going to, a lot of people, if you miss out on this game, you're missing out on, a, on something that's going to be iconic, in my opinion. Oh, yeah. Beat-em-ups are actually, um, a lot of people don't realize this, because I, I haven't streamed a lot of them on my channel, but my favorite genre of all time are beat-em-up games. Nice. Like, my number one favorite genre. Like, you give me, like, Red Dead Redemption or Grand Theft Auto or whatever new game comes out, and then you put, like, Final Fight next to it, I'm going to go play Final Fight. Like, I'm huge into beat-em-ups, man. Final Fight is actually my second favorite game of all time. And wow. Streets of Rage was an answer to Final Fight. So, yeah, man, like, I- I'm excited about that game. Any new beat-em-up? I, I think beat-em-ups need to make a big comeback, because think about all the recent beat-em-ups we've had. They've been great. I mean, we've got that. Yeah. You remember uh, Double Dragon Neon? Did you play that one? I didn't get a chance to play it. Nah. I love that game. I love that game. I haven't game. got a chance to play many of, like, the indie titles, because it's... One money, two. When I finally started playing a lot of these newer games, it's they took up my time. But now that I got a, a, a larger SD card, I'm gonna start looking at some indie games. And Double Dragon Neo may be one of them because I like I like the fact. You know what? Okay, this is the biggest thing about Streets of Rage Four that we need to talk about because I'm super excited for it. Has online. Yeah, it's two player online, four and player, player local. local. I'm for that. Yep. I'm for that. I'm fine. I'm I'm okay with two player online because I grew up with two player uh, Streets of Rage playing on Streets of Rage one, you know. So yep. I'm fine with that. But I w- I'm just really interested in seeing like how is this going to do because, like you said, there's a lot of. I guess we could we could just talk about this. I'm noticing in, in the gaming community, <coughs> there's a lot of complaining before you actually play the game. Oh man, I've been seeing can of worms. <laughs> I've been seeing that a lot. I've been seeing that with um, Resident, Evil Resi- Resident Evil Three. Uh-huh. I saw that with Final Fantasy Seven Remake. I've seen that with you br- bringing this to my attention with Streets of Rage Four. And I'm like, when do we get to a point where we complain about games more than we actually play them? Uh, yeah, it's it's a shame too because there's there's a. I, I think it is a small group of people that will solely not buy a game because they hear complaints from others. Um, I think a lot of the people that complain didn't even have plans to buy the game. Mm. Like I, I've noticed that with a lot of people because I, I don't know if you remember when Mortal Kombat 11 came out. That's the that's one of the biggest examples I could think of with this. What did you hear when Mortal Kombat 11 came out? All you heard was loot boxes. That's all you ever heard: loot boxes and microtransactions. But if you actually played the game, the biggest complaint was the crypt where you unlock all the stuff. Mm-hmm. If you actually played it, it doesn't even allow you to use real world money. No. But for some reason, that was the main complaint. Resident Evil 3 comes out. What's the, the main thing you hear? It's four hours long. But then when you dig deeper, and I talk about this in my review for it, I dug deep into it. But you hear it's four hours long, but then you find out they played on normal and they blew through the campaign. 
when if you played old school Resident Evil, you know Resident Evil is designed about replayability. So that's why when you beat the game, it unlocks a whole shop with stuff that you can buy and two new difficulty levels. I spent 40 hours in that game before I reviewed it and I completed 100%. So is it four hours long, really? You know, that's that's what I mean. Like, people don't take the time to analyze what they hear about games and they just suck up the headlines. The same thing you and, say... I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, no, you're good. No, the same thing you say about Resident Evil, I can say about Final Fantasy VII Remake. People saying it's a 20, 30-hour game. You know, if you don't do the side quests, I'm like, if you do, I didn't do every single side quest. I'd say I did about 80%, 85, no, wait. I'd, I'll say I did about most of the side quests. I did all the side quests, but not all the mini games. I didn't do all the mini games. I did about, let's just say 95, right? And you do the main story. It's about 42, 43 hours, right? You unlock hard difficulty after that. And more stuff is unlocked on top of that. Yeah, and, and I think, and that's what I mean. I think that's what people miss out on, like, a lot of games are really designed around replaying it over again, mm-hmm. you know, and also let me add on. Does every game need to be 80 to 100 hours long? No. Like, does it really? No. Because another thing, too, and, and there's a lot of hypocrisy when it comes to game reviewers online, because if you look at this, uh, Assassin's Creed Odyssey is another example I like to use. Mm-hmm. What did you hear when that came out? Oh, nothing happens for the first 15 hours. It takes too long for the game to get going. Which, by the way, is not necessarily true. But let me use another example. Red Dead Redemption. People said the same thing about that game, but that game got universal praise. But it was a slow grind. But then it was praised for it. So you're going to complain about one and then praise the other one for the exact same reason. People pick and choose. And at the end of the day, what I'm trying to get to is play games yourself and make decisions yourself. Instead of just seeing like... Like, I'm a YouTuber. Don't listen to me. Watch me for entertainment, but make your own opinion at the end of the day. You that's, know? That's what I tell people. I said, listen, if you want an unbiased review, I said, don't go on Metacritic. Metacritic is overrated. Oh, uh, God. Go go watch a playthrough. Go watch someone's playthrough and see if you can enjoy the game like that. And if it looks like something that you would have fun doing, go buy the game. If it looks like yeah. something you won't like doing, don't buy the game. Keep it moving. Well, like, do you know how many games I've seen that have gotten bad reviews that I've enjoyed that I wouldn't have played if I had listened to some random Kotaku article or some random big YouTuber? Like, you know, there's there's so many games. I could say Xenoblade Chronicles 2. I've heard so many people say so many bad things about that game. Oh, oh low re- resolution. The, the combat system is confusing and all these things. I played it for myself. One of the best rpgs on the switch yeah yeah and also another thing too like even short games if a game truly was short it could still be a fun experience at the same time right uh what one of the ones i liked the most was um do you remember the order 1886 i remember that game actually i haven't played it but i remember it what's there is really good um the game's only like five hours long like legitimately i platinumed it in like five hours it's it is very short but it is a good game. You know, maybe not $60 worth for that length of time, but it is a good game. But that's not what you hear. All you hear about is the length. But what about what was in there? You know, you take your family, you have a couple kids, take your family, spend like 30 bucks at the theater for a two-hour movie. You know? I mean, think about that. And this is a, this is a game and experience that you paid for, you know, that, that that's, an, that's like a rental experience. Like, you do that mm-hmm. for $20, $30, go to the movie theaters you're done you spent let's say you did pay sixty dollars that's that's yours for life yeah so speaking of game rentals like can you imagine a blockbuster still existed because i mean think about this or Funko go Land. back in time well yeah go back in time to when blockbuster existed you could rent like a nintendo 64 game you beat it in a day or two and you return it no late fees but what about now? What if you rented like Assassin's Creed Odyssey? You're, there's no way you're going to beat that before you have to return it. Mm-mm. You know, it's funny thinking about that sometimes because like how times have changed so much. Yeah, you're not you're not going to beat that. It's like I feel as though the day, the days of like speed running through games. I feel like you really need to, need to be gifted at that. Other than that, if you're speedy running a game, you're not really enjoying the full essence of a game. And that's why yeah. I commend you for what you're doing with Final Fantasy VII because you're going to enjoy this a lot. 
just by taking your time. Yeah. I know it is hard playing it only once a week, let me tell you. Bruh, I can't I can't imagine. So, yeah. But you I mean, you you did you did a lot cuz like how many how many um This is like going on week 2. Right? I've streamed Three it. Weeks. Hold on. Stream Yeah. This is the second yeah, I've streamed it twice. I've streamed it twice. I stream for like three or four hours usually. So I've been averaging like three chapters a stream. So I just actually a little more than that. I just finished the Airbuster fight, which is chapter seven. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess I'm nearing kind of the halfway point of the game. I've been loving it though, man. It, it's yeah. been awesome. And it's, oh God, like I, I've heard so many complaints about people that complain about like what's been added into the game. Yeah, you know, people complain about that because it's different from the original. And, and again, this takes me back to Resident Evil 3. A lot of people complained about things they changed also, but it's like, do people just want the same game again but looking prettier? Like, what's the point of remaking a game if it's not going to be a significantly different experience, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, they've added a lot to Final Fantasy VII, but what if what they added was good? What if it's entertaining? Like, is that a bad thing? See, the thing is, they did add... I'm not giving you no spoilers, but what they added was worth it. Yeah, that, that's what I mean. Like, who cares if it's different? Like, for example, one, and I'll keep it spoiler free, but like, Resident Evil 3, I had people complaining on one of my streams, a, a certain character that dies in the original Resident Evil 3, they were upset that he died in a different way. It's like, what's well, a completely different experience? Like, just go play the original. It still exists. I think, thank, thank you. Thank you. That's <laughs> something that you know a good buddy of mine we always say if you want the original game go play the original game yeah like, no one burst in your house and took it away i think people forget that game game developers are content creators themselves yeah and it's almost like if from one content creator to another i wouldn't want to change somebody to my nostalgia and my expectations right it's almost like you want to give them the liberty to be creative and Oh man, have you played the original Final Fantasy VII? Yeah, oh yeah. Like I, I told you before. Like I know we talked about this, but I, growing up, I wasn't big into like turn-based JRPGs at all. Final Fantasy VII and VIII, though, I was. Like those were the two that I played. And I, by the way, Final Fantasy VIII is my favorite one. I, everyone says seven. Seven's close too for me. I, I really like eight. So I hope that gets a remake too. No, I respect it. I was even talking to someone on Twitter. I said, imagine if Belam Garden got that same treatment as Final Fantasy VII Remake. It would look amazing. <laughs> it like, would look amazing. Belam but yeah, I, I wasn't into those games. But with Final Fantasy VII and VIII, like, the story and the universe and the characters, like, it, it absorbed me, like most people. So yeah, those games are absolute classics, man. Absolute classics. I say seven, eight, and 9 are the best in the series. Like... This, I'll say this much. This Final Fantasy VII, it, for me, the re, I beat the remake. The remake rivals the original. Yeah. That's, that's I, what I'm going to well, say. Well, think about this. And a lot of people don't want to hear this, but it's true. The people that say Seven Classic is the better game, I mean, are they really taking the nostalgia glasses off? Like, if you remove the nostalgia away and just look at it from pure game, like the mechanics, graphically, I mean, obviously, but the game mechanics, just everything else that makes a video game a video game, yeah, this one is way better, an improvement in every way. That's, I, I try not to look at things with nostalgia and judge I, it that way, because nostalgia overpowers everything. It does, and everyone is comparing, like, the, like, they look at the story, they're mad at how, like, the story changes. I'm going to tell you, the way they're writing the story now, it made me appreciate it made me appreciate Midgar so much more. So much more. Like yeah. I could talk about the things that you have seen and everything. Like the fact that you made connections with people in Sector 7 and they made Sector 7 like a real thing. That's that that hit home for me because it you didn't you didn't get that in the original. In the original I'll put it to you this way. The uh, the amount of time it took you to beat the Guard Scorpion to get on the train and get to Sector 7, if you was to and do a little bit of the jobs in Sector 7, around that span of time is around the time you would probably left Midgar. 
any original. Yeah, I mean, you spend way more time there, and that came up on my stream, my first stream. It was funny, because I had just played the classic, like, I downloaded it on PS4, so the week before the remake came out, I felt like pay, playing through the classic again, so I'm playing it, and then the remake came out, and about three hours into my stream, I was like, okay, I just got to this part. That took like 15 minutes in the original game. Exactly. But the remake, it's like three hours deep, and I felt like I had been through a bunch of stuff. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's an improvement over the classic. It really is. It just, you. It, it is. It's a huge improvement, man. But, I'm, um, I'm curious. How, well, let me ask you a question. How do you think they're going to handle Chapter 2? Like, the leveling system? Because I was talking about that on my stream. And are they going to send you back to, like, level 1 and you have to... You, it's funny you asked that. I asked the same question. This is one of my my main concerns. I asked on, on a few podcast episode, episodes ago when I had a guest on here. And that's one of my main concerns. After playing this game, I don't think they will. Max level is 50. And this one? And this one, your max level is 50. So I wonder if they're just going to start you... I wonder if there's going to be some kind of like import system like Mass Effect. That's what I think there's going to be because you don't get all the weapons... You don't get all the weapons. You do get some some pretty high level material that you get later on in the game, but you don't get the most crazy stuff. I'm not gonna say I'm yeah. not gonna name off all the materials and everything, but um, you do get and you don't you don't even get um a good number of the summons that you right. get. So and even some of the weapons that you get is still on the lower end. They don't give you all of the weapons. They don't. I'm trying not to give no spoilers, but they don't they don't they don't give you everything. So because they don't give you everything, and because the max level is fifty, I feel as though whatever level people beat the game at, and that save file, they're gonna say that save file can transfer over. Yeah, to... there, there's got to be some kind of like importing system, and also like, I don't know why anyone would do this, but what if someone just picks up chapter two, and starts with that? Like, are they gonna start? It'll, be, it'll, like, it'll probably be like a like a they, base level. Or, I they guess. may they may have like a base level. They, they they may make it for both. They may make it for both because some people may not want to play the first game. They may do it like how they did Dot Hack. Remember how Dot Hack was on, <coughs> on the PS2? Like it had part one, part two, part three, part four. Right. And your level system would carry over. So what I'm thinking they may end up doing is for the people who may not want to start over, they may give you a base level of thirty or thirty five. Yeah, in the second one, but in the second one, that you may only have the Buster Sword. You may not have all the no, other I, weapons. No, I want all my stuff that I earned. Exactly. That's <laughs> I, I want all my stuff. I want my menu to look exactly the same when I start up part two. And that's what I, I mean. Let's we'll see. I, we've has there been another example like this in recent years, like with mm -hmm. a game that I don't think there has been with a game that transferred over i mean there really hasn't been anything that would require that though there hasn't been yeah so it, it's, it's gonna be interesting but i think what i what i what i do believe is this game because they did what because they're doing what they're doing i think this is going to be a, either a two or three part series i i can't imagine it's going to be less than two i'm or less than two less than three i can't imagine they're going to release chapter two and it's done with the rate they're going i mean what was the original what three three discs three discs and i would say the reason why is because midgar everyone's complaining that midgar was, was it's, a, it's a linear game i said midgar was linear in, in the original so and it's, it's semi-short too so it's like you so. can't you can't get mad at them making a linear part of the game linear in a remake so yeah. that's, that's why my predictions for the for the second part is going to be an open world game. It's going to look probably more like Final Fantasy 15. 15. Yep, that's what I was thinking about. Um, I think it's going to be three chapters. In my mind, I can imagine them treating it like the original. Like it's three discs, so each chapter is going to be, you know, disc one, two, and three. We're going to have remake one, two, three. I, I, I think that. that's the best way to do it. I can see that. I can see that. What, what I can see them doing too. I could see them actually finishing out the game, like the original game with the second chapter, and then chapter three is going to be just brand new rewriting of everything. Like not rewriting, yeah. but add on, adding on. Well, they're already doing that, so yeah, they they are. They there's a lot. I'm 
I'm doing good by not saying anything, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it's going to be... I'm hoping it doesn't take too long. Because this one I took think... forever, but they, they already did start development on two. I they, mean, did. They, they did. They did. It's going. They're far. They're far along in two. I think two will be here by next year, actually. I don't think it's going to be that long of a wait. It makes me wonder if, like, three is going to end up on, like, PS5. They probably you will. Know? And they probably... They, they probably will. But, um... Let me ask you. Let me ask you this: Like, because we had, you know, Resident Evil, we had Doom, we got Streets of Rage, we got Final Fantasy VII remake, we got Trials of Mana this month. Do you think we're gonna have another month as explosive as April for the rest of the year? For this year? Yeah. I don't see another I, the month. Top no, top I, I, I don't think so. And I'll tell you why. I mean, think about it. We have two new console generations popping up at the end of this year. Yep. So usually. All the big games, I mean, they're not going to come out right at launch like that, you know? You know, every new console generation is always kind of a slow start. I think next year we'll have a month like this again. But this year, I think I think this is as um, explosive as it's going to get. I think like, the I, only console that have a good, like, powerful launch launch, like in this generation, with, with games, with a good game library, was the Switch. Because you kicked off with Breath of the Wild. Like you kick off the year with Breath of the Wild, and you they had a game. Zelda game. Yeah, I mean you have a, a Zelda, Zelda game you got a and a launch. Mario. You got a Zelda yeah. and a Mario game in your launch year. Your first year, you got Zelda and Mario. Which unpopular opinion? I got. I don't think Breath of the Wild is the best Zelda. So like, I really don't. I don't either, actually. Yeah, really? No, I always Ma- get like Majora's Mask is my favorite one. Mine is see Link to the Past is my favorite. That's, I, that's my number one. Respected. Ocarina of Time is probably number two. But Breath of the Wild, like, it was good. Don't get me wrong. It's a great game. But I can think of, like, five other Zeldas that I like way better. I do, too. You know? I It's part of me, as I look back and everything, if they was to remake Skyward Sword with actual controller controls, I think I probably would enjoy that more than, than um, Breath of the yeah, Wild. Yeah, I love Skyward Sword. The, re, the, the one thing I don't like about it is having to use the motion controls. Exactly. So yeah, if, like, they, just if, they just, if they could just, just format it with this... Mm-hmm. Easily top five Zelda. Easily. I agree with that. Easily. But yeah, Breath of the Wild's a great game though. I mean I dumped like a hundred hours into it easily. So I like it. I, I don't want to come off like I don't like it, but I, yeah, the game I'll say this. The game is definitely a breath of fresh air. It it, 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 it accomplished the Breath of the Wild feel. It is a breath of fresh air because when you play it on like your big screen TV, you know you got this portable it's like you you could take it, and it's almost like the same game that you're playing on your TV. It's mind-boggling to play a game like that, you know, in 2017. And even now in 2020, it's crazy to play a game like that. So I would say Zelda Breath of the Wild is easily, you know, it's up there one of my Switch games. It's definitely up there. Yeah. You know, you know one thing that really disappointed me about it, though? What's up? Is, like, I'm an old-school Zelda fan. Like, I've been playing Zelda since, I mean, 1980 Zelda, the original. And one thing about Zelda, like, there's always a variety of dungeons, a variety of bosses. This one, there's four dungeons. They all kind of look and feel the same. And, you know, the four bosses just kind of felt like a, a different version of the other bosses. Like, they didn't feel truly different, you know? And to me, that, to me that's kind of where this one fell apart compared to classic Zelda. Like, look, look at Ocarina of Time. Like, when you get to the Forest Temple, you fight Phantom Ganon. Then you fight a giant fire dragon in a volcano. You then you fight some water monster in a temple. Where's the variety in Breath of the Wild, you know? Then you, then you fight the, the freakiest boss of all time in Zelda from the Shadow Ooh, Bongo Temple. Bongo Bongo? Yes. Yeah, Bongo Bongo. I didn't... Oh, my god! But you see what I mean, though? They were all yeah. very different from one another. And I, I'll give you that because the Spirit the spirit Temple and Ocarina of Time, even the Stone, Stone Tower and Majora's Mask is like some of my favorite temples because of how unique and designly they were built. They were built yeah. in a way that it it made you appreciate you know the aesthetics they did with the, with the game and hopefully breath of the wild 2 rekindles that yeah i, I kind of hope like i feel nintendo since breath of the wild was so successful that they're probably just going to move on with the breath of the wild formula i'm kind of hoping though that they bring back some of the more classic elements like that Me too. I, I don't want the whole future to be just like breath of the wild was the thing is, they like they're heavy on exploration. They get into people from Monolith Soft to design the worlds and everything. And don't get me wrong, the people who you know, the Xenoblade series are, is, are really good. My favorite one. 
out of the series more and more, the more I think about it, is actually Zelda Blade X on the Wii U. And don't get me wrong, they could design beautiful worlds, but your worlds cannot be your end all be all. You gotta yeah. make something that's going to resonate with everybody. And the dungeons, you gotta make great dungeons. I'm with you 100% on that. You yeah, have to. That's make a great core dungeons. like. That's a core aspect of Zelda is the dungeons. You know what my dream Zelda game is? I don't know if it's ever going to happen, but the original Zelda, the very first one, make that Breath of the Wild style. Like, remake that game mm -hmm. in the style of Breath of the Wild. That'd be awesome. They probably... So. Well, in the style of Breath of the Wild, like, same graphical style, or just in terms of gameplay-wise? Well, I mean, that gameplay-wise. like and, and, well, and the graphic style. Like, instead of top-down like the original... Make it like that full open world, but it's the original game, the original story. Remake all the dungeons and bosses, but up to today's day, like how Resident Evil Three did with, or Final yeah. Fantasy, like how Final Fantasy did from classic to new one. It's just this huge facelift. That'd be really cool. I think that would sell really well. Okay, I agree. Um, let me. What were your? And I'm gonna ask you this, and then we're gonna start uh, wrapping this up. What was your thoughts on Link's Awakening, the remake? I thought it was awesome. I, I like Link's Awakening on the Game Boy. When it came out on the Switch, um, oh man, when I went to E3 last year, I was so mad. Have you been to E3? No, I haven't. I was so mad because e is cool, but what is E3? It's a ton of lines mm -hmm. all day. And when, when you go to E3, it was my second year, so I already kind of knew what I was doing. I was like, I got to make a game plan. I got to figure out what I want to see because you're not going to see everything you want. There's no time. On the last day, the last thing I wanted to see that I hadn't seen yet was Link's Awakening. Uh, so I went in line to play the demo, and then they closed the building and had us get out of line because they had cut it off already. So I, I couldn't play it until it came out. I was dang. so mad because I was so excited. And they gave out this cool little keychain if you played it, too. Dang, So, man. yeah, I was, I was pissed. Dang. Um, that it was, was fun though. Actually, one of my longtime viewers happened to be there, and they waved me down. So that was kind of cool. Oh, that's what's he up. got the yeah he got to play it. It's not me, but um yeah that game I really liked it. I I liked it. Um, a lot of the complaints it got. Some people didn't like the graphics. They look cartoony. But I mean, if you play the original Game Boy one, it, it looks like that one. It, it looks like the Game Boy one, just better. I I would I would agree with you on that. Like the Zelda Link's Awakening. First of all, that was my first Zelda that I played. Oh I played, really? Yes, that was the first Zelda that I played. Then Ocarina of Time. Gotcha. Then Majora's Mask. Then Oracle of Ages and Seasons, and then stuff like that. So when I played Link's Awakening, it just it brought me back, and I would say I like the charm because the the new the remake had a certain charm to it, and even though it looked too cartoony, the game was still, it still had the challenges that the original Link's Awakening had, in my opinion. Yeah. So, I Well, think about it. this, too. Like, you said it looked too cartoony, but think about this. Take all the Zelda games. You've got Twilight Princess that has a more kind of darker, realistic, kind of like a, almost like a Lord of the Rings feel. Mm -hmm. And then look at Wind Waker. Wind Waker, I mean, that straight up looks like a kid's cartoon, and it's one of the best Zeldas. It is. So, it is. I, I actually talk to people about that because Zelda... Now, here's one of my complaints about Breath of the Wild, the lack of music. To me, one of the core staples of Zelda is Completely great. great music. The music in Zelda Breath of the Wild, I felt like I got duped because the music you hear in the trailer, it gives you that Legend of Zelda feel when you listen to the trailer. And it was trailer music. And then when you played like it, exactly, we played a game yep. and it's like... All right, where, where the music at? It's like you're used to that, and I get it. It worked for a post-apocalyptic dead world, but when you play, it's like you have to consider like my perspective. Literally the night before I went to go get my Switch from Walmart at, at midnight, I was playing Wind Waker on my on my Wii U, and I can literally remember like the the music when you're out sailing during the day daytime uh -huh. and then just like ocarina of time everything becomes dead at nighttime and i'm like uh -huh. where is that type of feel in zelda breath of the wild like sure breath of the wild looks great it looks beautiful on the tv you know it looks looks beautiful on the monitor whatever you want to play it on but 
I feel like it lacks that charm when yeah. you don't have the music. I agree with that, and I, I think I think Nintendo's thinking was what you said. It's a post-apocalyptic world, but I mean, so was Wind Waker, and yeah. that had a great. I mean, look, the Wind Waker, the post-apocalyptic world. That's the whole premise of that game. It is, and that still had an awesome soundtrack. It is. It, I agree exactly. with that. Exactly, but um, we're gonna go ahead and wrap this up because we actually went through all the questions I have for you and more. So this was definitely a fun interview. Um, definitely, guys, I want you guys to make sure you check out uh, Fabian Gamer Thumbs on his channel. His information is down below. Before you go, though, ask everyone this question: Do you have any advice? Well, any extra advice? We've been giving advice all night. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you have any extra advice for anyone who's still watching at this point? As far as being a content creator? Content, exactly. As far as being a content creator. To sum everything up, have fun with what you're doing. I mean, in all seriousness, there's no point in doing anything YouTube related if you're just in it for the money. I, it's At that point, it's, it's just another day job. You know, yeah. have fun. Have fun with what you're doing. Have fun with what you're doing in life. You know, that, that's the most important thing. 100%. And if you're not having fun, then you should question why you're doing it in the first place. Because I'll tell you one thing. There's a quick short story. I did gaming news, wasn't having fun. Was stressed out, burnt out, tired, almost quit YouTube. Don't be like me. <laughs> so don't be like old me. Because me now, I, I love doing these Beast for Breakfast videos. So until next time, thank you guys for watching. If you guys like this video, hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button. And most of all, most of all, you make sure you share this with a friend. This is David Don and Gamer Thumbs. And we are out. Peace.